Hello there, my name is Path, and in this video I want to talk about a really wonderful parallel between two completely different areas of physics. We'll look at two very similar equations that describe entirely different things, understand what they actually mean, and then see why they're so similar. So if you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. First things first, let's look at one of the physical systems that we'll be studying in this video. Let's imagine we have a block that has some mass m connected to a spring. The spring has a spring constant k, which is just a measure of how strong or stiff our spring is. Specifically, an ideal spring in physics will exert a certain force to try and get back to its equilibrium state or its natural length when it's either stretched or squashed. And the exact amount of force it exerts for every unit displacement is the spring constant. More force for the same extension means a stiffer spring with a larger spring constant and vice versa. Anyway, so we have this mass on a spring and let's imagine that our system is in outer space. So the only force that is acting on any part of this system is the force of the spring. Also to keep things simple, let's imagine that the mass of the spring is small enough that we can basically ignore it compared to the mass of the block. Now we decide to pull the spring from its equilibrium position and let it go. What happens? Well, at this point, there is a force from the spring pulling the mass in this direction. So the mass accelerates in that direction. And as the spring gets closer to its natural length, the force that the spring exerts gets smaller and smaller until the spring eventually reaches its natural length and at that point, there are no forces being exerted by the spring on the mass. But notice that at this point, the mass already has some speed in this direction. It's already moving this way. And what happens to an object with speed and with no forces acting on it? Well, Newton's first law of motion tells us that an object moving with some speed continues to move at that speed unless another force acts on it. So our mass actually moves past the equilibrium position, at which point the spring is being compressed and the force is now in this direction, trying to push the spring back to its natural length again. It's getting stronger and stronger as the mass travels further and further this way. The force acts to decelerate or slow down the mass until it reaches its maximum displacement in this direction and then it turns back. And the mass spring system therefore bounces back and forth forever since we don't have any frictional forces in our system at this point. This particular motion is known as simple harmonic motion. It specifically occurs when the force being exerted is proportional to the displacement and the force is in the opposite direction to the displacement. So the more the object is moved away from equilibrium, the larger the force. And also the force acts to move the object back to equilibrium we can derive an equation to describe this motion, which is that the total force on the object, mass times acceleration, according to Newton's second law of motion, is just given by the force of the spring minus kx. Rearranging this, we get ma plus kx is equal to zero. We don't have to rearrange this, but this version just looks a bit more nice. Now let's remember that the acceleration of the mass is inherently linked to the position of the mass. Because as the mass changes position, we can find its velocity, which is how much distance it moves per unit time. And how quickly this velocity changes, or velocity per unit time, is acceleration. When dealing with continuously changing speeds and positions rather than constant ones, we use this notation. We find the derivative the derivative of x with respect to t, or how quickly x changes over time, is the velocity. And how quickly the velocity changes over time is the acceleration of our mass in this case. So at this point, we have an equation for the motion of our block in terms of its mass, its position, the time at which we're considering it, and the spring constant. Lovely. Now let's introduce some other forces to our system that will stop the motion from being simple harmonic, but will create a rather interesting equation. Let's first imagine that our block is moving through some liquid. Maybe it's water, maybe it's golden syrup, doesn't really matter. What we're introducing here is friction. 
as the block moves through the liquid, the liquid will resist the motion of the block. There are many different ways to model this kind of friction, but the one that we will look at here is one that works relatively well for the mass moving fairly slowly through our liquid. The force exerted on the block depends directly on how fast the block is moving at any point in time through our liquid. In other words, the faster the block moves, the more the liquid resists its motion. In other words then, we can say that the frictional force is directly proportional to the velocity of the block. But once again, it acts in the opposite direction to the motion. Because of course, friction resists motion. That's the point of friction. This constant of proportionality here is basically a measure of the frictional strength of the liquid itself. A higher friction liquid, such as thick goopy syrup, will have a higher constant of proportionality than a less sticky fluid like water. And let's remember that the block's velocity is just the rate of change of its displacement or position, depending on how we're looking at it, dx by dt. So what does the equation look like now? Well, the net force on the mass, ma, is given by the sum of the spring force and the friction force. We have to account for both this time. And both of these are negative because they both act against the direction of displacement, which is what we defined to be positive initially. And now if we rearrange, we get this equation. The final piece of the puzzle is if we decide to introduce some driving force. So this time we exert a constantly changing external force on the block. We're pushing along the block in order to drive it. Now this driving force can basically be any force that we could feasibly exert on the block. But a really simple one to consider is one where we periodically push the block in opposite directions. So the strength of the force varies like a sine curve or a cosine curve or something like that. Now the frequency with which this force is changing doesn't necessarily have to match the natural frequency of oscillation of the system itself. We could change the strength of the force at any rate that we want to. We could change it really quickly or we could change it really slowly. Let's call the frequency with which this force varies F subscript E, where E stands for external. Of course, if the driving frequency matches the natural frequency of the system, then we get a thing called resonance, where the oscillation gets bigger and bigger in size because the applied force exactly matches what is needed to make the motion bigger and bigger. Whereas in other cases, at some points, the force we will exert will be against the motion of the system and so won't lead to a compounding effect where the amplitude gets bigger and bigger. More on resonance in a future video. But so how do we include this applied external force into our equations? Well, starting once again with the net force as mass times acceleration, we include the other forces from earlier and this time we also include the driving force. Now this force is positive just because initially its value was in the positive direction as we defined it. But it actually could have been a sine curve or something in between. It just depends on where in the cycle we decide to start at t is equal to zero. And once again, we rearrange our equation. This time we'll keep the driving force on this side, though this is of course not necessary. We're rearranging in an arbitrary way based on what we think looks nice to us and this version looks nice to me. Now, what we have here is a new differential equation because it contains differentiated terms or derivatives that we saw earlier. And these are derivatives of position with respect to time. Now this equation is the one I want to focus on in this video, because if we take this equation and modify a few variables, then this exact same equation with the same form can be used to describe how charged particles behave in certain electric circuits like this one. To understand what we mean by this, Let's first recall that in electric circuits, we have charged particles moving, most commonly electrons, and thus we have a current in the circuit. A current is simply the amount of total charge passing a given point per unit time. In very generic terms, imagine we had charged particles that each have a charge of one coulomb rather than electrons forming the current in our circuit. If within our circuit, we had five of these particles passing this point here every second, then the current at this point in the circuit would be five times one coulomb or five coulombs per second, which is equivalent to five amps. Now, in reality, each electron has a much smaller charge. 
and there are many more than five electrons passing a point per unit time in a circuit. Partly because there are many electrons along the width of a wire, but the principle here is exactly the same. We can essentially count the number of electrons passing a point per unit time and calculate the total amount of charge passing this point per unit time by multiplying this number by the charge on one electron. This total charge passing a point per unit time is basically the current that we have at this point in the circuit. What this means then is that current is simply the rate of change of charge with respect to time, or how quickly charge moves per unit time. This can be written as dq by dt, where q is charge and t is time. That looks a bit like this term in our equation. And on top of this, we can also calculate how quickly the current changes with time in a circuit. This bit looks a little bit like this term in our equation. So what is this equation actually studying? Well, it's essentially looking at the voltage or potential difference across different parts of our circuit. If you're not familiar with what voltage is, then I'll leave some resources in the description box below. So let's now look at each term in our equation in detail. The simplest one in this case is this term on the right hand side. It's the driving voltage, which is the voltage supplied to the circuit by our power supply. These can supply various different kinds of voltage, but the simplest alternating voltage, at least theoretically, is a sinusoidal one. In this case, a cosine function, so the voltage starts at its max value, then decreases, reaches its maximum negative value, and then increases again, and so on and so forth. Next, we'll look at the middle term on this side of the equation. This one describes how resistance in the circuit affects voltage across the component or components that have resistance. For simplicity, we've assumed that all the components in here are perfect or ideal components. This means that this here is a perfect resistor, this is a perfect inductor, this is a perfect capacitor, and this is a perfect power source. What this means is that only the resistor has resistance and none of the other components have any resistance at all. And the same is true for inductance and capacitance. More on them in the description as well. Now, this term in our equation essentially looks at the voltage across the resistor. How so? Well, it's because it's the resistance of the resistor multiplied by dq by dt, which is the current in our circuit. We may have seen an equation that looks like this in the form of Ohm's law, which is often taught in high school physics. Now, I have a whole video about Ohm's law and why this technically kind of isn't really Ohm's law. So check it out up here if you're interested, or it's linked in the description below as well. And in very similar ways, these two terms describe the voltage across the inductor and the capacitor, respectively. A capacitor's voltage is dependent on the charge stored on the plates of the capacitor and a property known as the capacitance of the capacitor, while an inductor's voltage is dependent on how quickly the current through the inductor is changing, as well as a property known as the inductance of the inductor. I'll make a separate video on capacitors and inductors, as well as capacitance and inductance at some point as well, so let me know in the comments down below if you'd like to see that. So, coming back to our equation then, all it's saying is that the sum of all the voltages across each of the components is equal to the voltage supplied by the power source. Makes sense, right? But the really interesting thing is that this system is an oscillator of sorts. Charge is bouncing back and forth along our circuit because it's an alternating current circuit. And hence, we can use the exact same equation with slightly different quantities to describe both a mechanical oscillator, like the mass spring system, and an electrical oscillator, like this circuit here. I find this really cool, a beautiful parallel across two very different areas of physics. And with all of that being said, I'm going to finish up here. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe and hit the bell button for more fun physics content. Check out my merch linked in the description below. It features a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein. And finally, a big thanks to all of my Giga patrons and all of the others over on my Patreon page. That's also linked down below if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you very soon.